you really do have to get over yourself. You have to assume that other people have something to teach you. You have to let them take the lead. It should all be a group effort where your ego and their egos are at the same level. Welcome to the Marketing Boost Solutions Podcast. Join host Marco Torres, co-founder of MarketingBoost.com, along with expert guests as they deliver incredible proven solutions to your marketing challenges in each power-packed episode. Captain Marco has guided thousands of entrepreneurs, growing their sales and marketing through the use of value-add incentives. His Facebook groups are home to more than 84,000 entrepreneurs who are raking in sales with his advice. Get ready to be blown away with game-changing lessons for your business. Today's guest is a proven revenue coach who owns a digital marketing agency. Her book, Roadmap to Revenue, provides the framework for exactly how to interview customers, ask the right questions, and then use that information to market effectively. She's an expert on how to sell the way your customers want to buy. She and her team help companies increase their revenue by delivering a steady stream of highly qualified leads and by helping company leaders manage their marketing and companies for true growth. Help me welcome Kristen Shivago to the show. Hello, Kristen. Hi there. Thank you for being on the show. We appreciate your time and wisdom with us. Tell us, Kristen, how you got into the digital agency space. Um, you... Um, Look like you might have been in this business for a while. I mean, <laughs> if, if you happen to be watching us on YouTube, you can see neither one of us are spring chickens. So she's got a little gray hair, so do I. <laughs> so Kristen, tell us how you got in this business, how long you've been in this space, and why you're the expert. Uh, okay, I've been in the business for more than 40 years, which is an awfully long time. But um, basically, I started out in tech. Uh, I was selling, I was the first woman to sell machine shop tools for, um, in the U S as far as I know for a Pratt and Whitney distributor and, uh, armed with my mini skirt and a catalog and nothing else. I mean, they just, you know, they didn't train me. There was <laughs> no, no other, uh, um, training for this, which is a big mistake. And I, I learned that really fast. I, I learned that you can't sell what you don't understand. And I vowed after one particularly um, disappointing call to learn everything I could about sales and technology. Um, I remember thinking that very thought out in the parking lot, going back to my old car and saying, you know what, this I've got to get better at this. And I've been doing that ever since. That was a changing point in my life. Um, I opened up a tech ad agency with my husband in Silicon Valley. Um, we did that for about 12 years. And then I could see with the, the advent of the Macintosh, everybody was going to be able to do a lot of their own marketing in-house. So my husband, who was doing all the graphics, was also an engineer. And I said, look, why don't you retire? Make things. That's what he loved to do. And so he did that. He was very busy all of his life doing that. And I set out to reinvent myself. I called myself a revenue coach because I knew CEOs and entrepreneurs didn't care about sales or marketing. They just wanted more revenue. They didn't care where it came from. So I started helping companies turn around their sales and marketing efforts in-house. I would take over the department and completely revamp it so they were starting to make money. I did that for a number of decades and by around, um, around, well, it was 2014. I actually, I could see that there were established businesses who did a great job with their products and their services, but they were like deer in the headlights when it came to marketing, uh, digital marketing. So I opened an agency with a friend of mine. Um, and then I split off from that after a while, our philosophies were a bit different. And I opened up Shivago Partners in 2017, and we've been going great guns ever since. We've been growing. Our clients keep giving us more work, um, and it's fun. We're really having a great time, and the company is organized in a way that allows us to scale easily and provide absolutely top-notch service all the time. So we're having a good time. 
Cool. Powerful. I mean, I've, um, like you, I've been an internet marketer since, um, you know, since for quite the some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got involved very early adapter since 1996 in my case and uh, watched it evolve. But it, it, it's, you know, you never, you never, I keep learning every day from people like you. It's always uh, evolving. It's always changing things yeah. that worked. Uh, I mean, there's certain staples that continue to work. Email marketing still works. You've got to yeah. be building you do it email. right. Yeah, yep. you've got to be building that email database if you do it right. And so back when I started, that was a, it was easy peasy in a way. We were just, you know, everybody who had their AOL account and everybody wanted email. They loved email. Shoot, your computer used to go, you've got mail. You know, now yeah. you, could, yeah. you could never handle all of those beeps. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so tell me about the book. When did you write the book and um, how did that come about? Actually, my second book, my first book was a rehearsal for the uh, for the the second book. Uh, so I only sell the second book. I actually wrote it, believe it or not, in 2011. But I'd been in tech so long, I knew how to write it so that it wouldn't go out of date. I mean, the technology has changed radically since then, um, and even since 94 when the web came out. Um, but I've always made sure that I'm on the tip of the spear and and keeping up with all the stuff. The AI thing is, is deep immersion at the moment. Um, the book basically, the reason I wrote the book is because every single time I picked up a new client, um, I would ask the client, what are the most important things to your customers? What do they want from you? What are their concerns? What are their questions? And they'd give me a list. And then I'd go out and interview their customers. And the list was completely different. Now, some of the items might have been on the list, but they weren't at the top. Um, and so there was this gap. There was a gap between the mindset of the seller and the mindset of the buyer. And I decided I had to fix that. So I basically gave away all the secrets that I'd learned from for working for hundreds of companies and interviewing thousands of customers and finding out how to how to uncover what I now call the mindset of the buyer when they set out to buy. And it does con, does con, um con, it is comprised of their it consists of their desires which is what they want their concerns and their questions. And when they come to your website, they have to immediately recognize that you know what their desire is. You know specifically, even in their own words, which is why you interview people who have bought from you, they'll tell you what they were looking for and why and all that. Um, so they'll immediately see themselves. The next hoop you have to jump through is, are you addressing their concerns within that area? Do you understand what they're dealing with, what their situation is? And then the third hoop that you have to jump through is, okay, now I think you might have an answer for me. You better answer my very specific questions. And this book teaches you how to get that kind of information out of your customers, the people who have already bought from you. When you. If you try to interview people when they're buying from you, they won't tell you what they're really thinking. Nobody ever tells a salesperson what they're really thinking because they're playing poker, they're negotiating. But once they've bought, they have an, invest in, an investment in your company, they want you to succeed, and they're happy to talk. And you set up the interviews, you do it on Zoom, audio, uh, no video, it just complicates things for them. And you tell them up front, you're going to record, because you can't type as fast as they talk, but that you're going to anonymize the, the findings. It's the reports categorized by question, by subject. And then well, they talk freely. I would have thought I would have thought that that was going to be, a, you know, a survey and send them some sort of email, ask them to participate. No. You're getting you're getting on the call yourself or staff or how do you recommend that business owner do it? Either yourself or someone who is a good listener and knows your business. They have to know the industry. They have to be somewhat familiar or very familiar with the products and so on. Because especially if you interview technical people, if they don't think you're understanding their language, they're just going to get bored and want to get off the call. 
if you do understand and here you're asking them for something that they don't have to study for this, they just tell you what they were thinking. People say, well, geez, somebody's going to talk to you for a half an hour about that. And the answer is yes. If somebody called you and really did care about your answers and was knowledgeable and would drill down if you know they had things they didn't understand. And all you're doing is saying, well, yeah, this is what I was looking. Think about buying a house or a car or something. And, and you certainly would be able to say, well, yeah, the things we needed were these five things. And this was a game changer. And this was, you know, the top of the, you just, you, you don't mind telling them about that. So then, and here's the beauty of the, of the method. You only have to listen to five to seven people of a given type. Like if it's the husband and the wife for a house, you talked to both. Or if it's the CEO, the purchasing agent, and the user of a technical product, you would interview all three. And you can get away with maybe four people each when you're doing that many. By the fifth or seventh call within a group, you will absolutely have bankable information. There will be phrases that they all use. There will be a theme, an overriding theme. This is the reason that I bought from you. And I looked at these other people, they didn't have that. So you're, this is the reason. And that's what ends up at the top of your website. You know, it's, it seems like that should be um, <laughs> a common sense, no brainer. That <laughs> yeah. Anybody in any business should do. Yeah. But I can be honest to tell you, I've never done it. And I would imagine that... Uh, uh, hundreds of others have never done it. We assume what our clients, why they, you know, we we have conversations. We have, you know, I've had group calls every day. We have group training. We we have an assumption of why they think they need our product and how our product solves the problem and what have you. But we're not interviewing one on one specifically, asking a series of questions designed to find out what motivated you to pull the trigger, what made it motivated you to buy. And what made it, you know, what motivated you to stay with us for three yeah. months, six months, you know, whatever. In in that, uh, uh, Kristen, do you suggest, like, uh, let's say you have a subscription model like Marketing Boost, would you su suggest that we be interviewing people that have been with us for five or six months or, or go for the ones that just signed up less than a month ago to find out what was that original, that original impulse that made them take action? Interestingly, people don't forget why they bought they can they can you can interview them five years later and they'll still remember it's an amazing thing because really they work hard they they don't want to be embarrassed they don't want to regret spending the money especially in a business to business setting but even even for business consumer things um so it that doesn't really matter what i think is important is that you talk to each so you sprinkle in a couple of the youngsters and then you go for the old timers, you know, as well. So you have a mix and you see what they say uh, differently. The The beauty of the old timers is that the people who've been with you a long time is that they have had more time to experience your service. And they they may say, well, they're real good at this, but they're not so good at that. And by the way, that becomes your brand. That's how people talk about companies. I have this famous saying I said years ago, which is the branding is the promise that you make. Your brand is the promise that you keep. And that's what people say. They're real good at this, but they're not so good at that. So right away, you know what you can promote because you're better at that than anyone else. And what you should be fixing in the background because it needs, it needs work, right? So this method gets to the heart of it. Now, again, I've been in tech for decades. I've been all along, you know, on the wave. And this AI stuff and, and, and having AI, the problem with that is AI doesn't know really honestly human to human and still humans are buying products at this, at this point in time. They don't understand those little specific things that people are looking for that, that make them like, this is it. This is the thing I wanted. So you have to get that from human beings. People are afraid to talk to their customers because they'll, they're, they're worried that they'll hear something terrible that they didn't even realize. I haven't found that. I found that they, they kind of, CEOs might know they have a problem in an area, 
but they hadn't th they didn't think it was the problem and then they find out from the customers that either that was the most important thing or it was the thing that made them almost not buy. Christian, what was that line again? I thought it was great. I didn't get a chance to write it down. It was branding is... Branding is the promise that you make. Your brand is the promise that you keep or break, by the way. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's what you're trying to uncover is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And by the way, you said the S word, surveys. I never do. I, I mean, surveys are okay for certain things, but they're just terrible at finding out this kind of information because it's your assumptions made into a questionnaire. You don't get the stuff outside the box. You don't get the stuff that you don't ever hear because they're too polite to say it or they, or they just tell other customers. And by the way, this is also different than just seeing reviews. Because people in a certain mind frame will say, and, and yes, there's wonderful information in reviews, but having this targeted conversation, you ask open-ended questions, by the way, and they're in the book. I worked them out over thousands of interviews. So things like, how did you feel about our product or service? Um, one of the best questions is, if you were the CEO of this company tomorrow, what's the first thing you would focus on or fix? So that tells you that promise keeping thing right there. What trends do you see in this area? What are your biggest challenges right now? If you were looking for this again in a search engine, what would you type in? These are all questions that one way or the other, you get all those answers that you need and it's bankable information. You're not gonna be throwing spaghetti on the wall anymore. Everything you do then can be based on these, these top themes. Wow. Now it would seem to me that it might be better off in a way if it was a high level person within the company to versus the owner, because does it, do people like hesitate to tell the, the actual owner what's really on my mind about your company or yeah, what have you versus talking not, to somebody yeah. that is a, you know, a high level executive, yeah. so to speak, or the person smart enough to like to ask the right questions, listen, like you mentioned, but not necessarily be the face of the company where that I really don't want to tell this guy. How I really feel. I'm this close to canceling or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually just the other way. It's that really? they're too polite. And believe it or not, I mean, given the way things are in the world right now, there's still a lot of polite people out there and they don't want to hurt the CEO's feelings. I actually did this exercise for our agency. Well, that's um, what I mean. Where That's what I mean. Where they might yeah. be too polite with the CEO yeah. or the owner yeah. of the company. And if it was somebody else in your organization that might be more willing to tell the whatever the nitty gritty truth of their, what they Yeah, think. I mean, even a good customer service person would be better inside than, than a top level executive. Um, obviously people have hired me to do this work over the years. And I'm, I'm a good example of a consultant who has the ear of top management, but I am separate from the company. Um, so Again, just somebody who's a good listener who knows the products and services and understands the customers well enough to ask these questions. I did that for our own company recently. And <laughs> uh, what I learned uh, was that that everyone loved the company, loved all the services, everything was good, but they worried what would happen to me if I you know, went to Tahiti or kicked the bucket or something. Uh, what would happen to the agency? And it was a good question. Uh, and it made me think about how I would, how setting up a plan, you know, what's going to happen to me if that happens, I need something to say, okay, guys, here's what you do. And I've got that worked out now and it's fine. But I didn't even think they were thinking that. Hmm. Interesting. So, you know, in your, um, okay, so once you have that, that series of feedback, that information, um, what do you As do you say, with it? Bankable information. You <laughs> yeah. talked about putting that at the top of the website. That's the main message you want to cover right away. What else? How do we then transfer that into the sales machine? Good question. Uh, the rest of the book after chapter three, chapter one and two is like, look, you got to start thinking like a buyer. You think you are right now, but you're not. So this is how you do it. Chapter three is all the instructions. And then I get into the Two things, the buying process for four types of products and services in the world. 
light scrutiny, medium scrutiny, heavy scrutiny, and intense. Light scrutiny, you see it, buy it, impulse purchases, not very much money. Medium scrutiny is like clothing. You have a couple of questions. No one else is involved. Heavy scrutiny is, okay, there's a contract. There's a salesperson. Um, you know, we, we, there, there's some big, deep stuff here that has to be addressed. And then intense scrutiny products and services are those where um, you get married, basically. It's just like heavy, but you get married. So um, what you want to do is understand the buying process. And I spell that out in the book. I've got a chapter dedicated to each one of those types of products and services and the questions they ask and how you address them. But the other side of this is making sure that top management does something with this data. So what you do is a conversation report where you've got all the transcriptions of the conversations broken up into the categories so they're anonymized. And sometimes for big companies, those can be 150 pages. And you'd think the CEO would never read it. They do. They stay up all night and read the whole thing um, because it's stuff that they didn't even think people were thinking before. They, they, it's like somebody telling you about your life, you know? And then I take that report and I tell people how to do this in the book. And I break it down into a summary and recommendations report, which kind of bulletizes it. So you get the big picture and then recommendations on, okay, now that we know this, here's what the theme, here are the things we should be doing. Here's how they buy. Cause one of the questions is, you know, what's your buying process for this type of product or service? Um, so I, I'm a great believer as a, as for years spending it as a consultant, I don't just give you the report. I then help you implement that into the business. And we used to have these big um, real life uh, meetings in, in conference rooms with big post-it, poster sized post-its that you'd put up all around. And you would just make sure that the, the top management was just completely immersed in the customer's mindset in that room. And now we do it virtually, but they get it. And then they start thinking like the customer. Now, there's one little side benefit to this. Marketers in companies that don't do this are constantly struggling to have power. They're constantly arguing with financial people and the manufacturing people and all the other people that the CEO respects because he can understand what they do. Marketing is not easy to understand. You put one thing in here and you hope you get that thing out and it doesn't always come. And so well, now we spent the money, why they didn't work. There's a lot of doubt and mistrust really by the CEO for sales and marketing. If you've made these calls yourself as a marketer, and I've spoken all around the world on this topic and marketers have come back to me and said, I can't believe what's happening now. Now the financial guy can say, oh, well, we can't do that. You know, we didn't do that at our last company. It didn't work. This marketing person can stand up and say, wait a minute, I just interviewed 15 customers and they all said this, okay? <laughs> that's power. And that's where real power comes from. That and obviously delivering results after you've done the right thing. But you don't have that power if you're guessing. Wow. Well, let's take a moment and guess and head to, uh, <laughs> we'll hear from our sponsor, Marketing Boost, and we'll be right back. It's time to wow, surprise, and impress your clients with the most powerful customer draw card available anywhere. The Marketing Boost Solution Show is brought to you by Marketing Boost, where you can get valuable travel and restaurant incentives to drive your leads from prospects to paying customers. Now you can offer complimentary hotel stays in over 130 destinations worldwide. Go to marketingboostsolutions.com and try it for free right now. You just heard from our sponsor, Marketing Boost. And if you haven't tried adding incentives to your call to action, go check out marketingboost.com as our amazing complimentary hotel stays in over 130 destinations around the world. Restaurant savings vouchers that come in multiple increments from as little as $25, 50, 100, or 200. And or our hotel savings cards that come in increments of one, two, three, and $500. 
to help design your call to action with an additional incentive to get folks to step off the fence, jump off the fence, and take action with your company. So we're back here talking to Kristen Shivago on how to increase sales, how to increase revenue. And uh, she wrote the book on it. We've been showing that multiple times here on the screen. Let me go ahead and pull that back up and show your website here. Shivagopartners.com, Shivagopartners.com, the digital agency. She wrote the book called Roadmap to Revenue. And, um, you know, we're sitting here talking about these specifics, some great, great content on how to uh, interview your customers starting from, it seems like that'd be the first step in your book, right? Take the, the first step is to go interview recent customers or past customers. And, and she, in the book, she describes exactly what questions or kinds of questions to ask and then build a whole roadmap from there. Am I uh, uh, giving that an overview that makes sense there? Yeah, it's good. Perfect. Now let's get let me, another question I've got for you is what do you say is the biggest barrier to the average business generating additional revenue growth? Ego. Ego. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. Yeah. Uh, break that down for us a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've helped companies go from the plateaus. People get stuck on these plateaus. So there's, you know, 200, thousand to a hundred and then up to a million, two million, two million to five, five to 10, 10 to 25, 25 to 50. Those are kind of the areas where people get stuck. And they usually get stuck because the CEO has founded the company often and dealt with the market successfully and things got good and they went rolling. He built, he or she built the company to satisfy that market. And then the market changes. A new competitor comes along that makes it easier and cheaper. And, um, you know, maybe they're good enough, which is the big enemy often to the companies that are trying to be perfect. So, and, and it could be, I mean, there's other issues, financial issues, financial mismanagement, not managing the cash flow and things like that. There's a lot of ways a company can fail. But in all my years of working with hundreds of CEOs and entrepreneurs, I can tell you that the biggest problem is thinking that the way we've done it is going to be the way we're always going to do it. And the situation is always going to be the same. Customers are always going to want the same things, their expectations, whatever. And, and not moving with the market because that's what you're good at. That's what you figured out. Um, there's also the the e myth the the e myth books where they talk about the fact that just because you're a baker doesn't mean you're going to be good at finance, for example. So you have to hire people who are better at those things than you are. And I have a team of people now that I I mean, I would die for these people. <laughs> they're they're so good, and they're really good at things that I'm not that good at them, and I'm okay with that. And it took me. I don't know until my fifties before I finally said, okay, that's enough. I, I can, I can get over myself. You really do have to get over yourself. You have to assume that other people have something to teach you. And then you have to do it. You have to let them take the lead, help them, you know, ask them for ideas, make sure that, that it should all be a group effort where your ego and their egos are at the same level. Or better, yeah. I've uh, recently experienced that. It comes to mind. I had uh, some people I was meeting with, and we're meeting every morning and discussing the marketing this and marketing that. And 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 this guy was going off, and it seemed like everything we showed him about our company, there wasn't a single thing that he would say. Well, I would do the following. I would change this, and I would change that. <laughs> and, and my ego got in the way. At one point, I'm like, you know what? I think my business has been around a lot, a lot longer than yours. And I've generated, how many clients do you have again? You know? <laughs> and I started, I started being kind of a jerk, challenging him, like, because my ego is getting in the way. He's like, boy, you want to change every darn thing about what I do. And, uh, but in the end, you know, I had to learn to, like you say, shut that down and allow the flow of ideas and the flow of, you know, new, um, uh, 
new new outlook on things because you get stuck in what you think is working and what have you. But it also reminds me of a, a years ago, one of the first when I went from being an entrepreneur back into the business world or back into a, a, a job, I sold the CEO of the company on the idea that we, if he could get his ego out of the way, and that was literally how I told him to his face. I said, if, if you'll get your ego out of the way, I've got an internet marketing strategy for you that will generate $200 million a year if you let me do it my way. And eventually he did, and I did end up delivering a huge, almost a billion dollars over the next eight years for his company. So it was a- Wow, good for you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun back then. But let's get back to uh, what is the biggest reason that, um, that, you know, that barrier exists that you mentioned? Why does that barrier exist in the first place, do you think? Well, partly entrepreneurs in particular, company founders are people who decide when they're working somewhere else that they have a better idea, that they, that they will be able to serve a market need better than the people that they're working for. And they often get extremely frustrated because of the very same thing that we're talking about here, where the CEO or the, the head of the company is just not listening and not moving when, when the situation changes. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneur sets out to do that better thing that he's been trying to get, he or she's been trying to get the CEO to do. And then after you've run the company a while and you're successful with it, then that's your recipe. You own it. I mean, it's it's pride city, you know? It's just like, man, I, I set out and I worked hard and I sacrificed. And I mean, I hardly saw my kids for, you know, 20 years or whatever the, the sacrifice is. And I built this thing. And then when the market shifts, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's times when a, an entrepreneur will refuse to sell something to a customer. I One of my little sayings in, in the revenue coaching business is when they're standing outside the door with money in their hand, you don't say, oh, we don't have time or that's not that doesn't interest us or, or that's a stupid idea. No, you let them in and you sit down with them and you say, okay, now explain this to me. What is this that you're talking about? How can we learn from it? How can we help? Because the people who are standing there with money in their hand think they already think you can help. They already know you and they're thinking, well, you know, these people could help me solve this problem. And that's where revenue opportunities come from. That's where growth comes from. And it also keeps you from being blindsided. One of the things, you know, staying on top of the tech industry has been a lifetime um, project for me. And one of the things I noticed when I was interviewing these customers for tech clients in particular, I did all tech until 94 when the web came out and then I branched out into every industry. But I noticed that I would hear things from those interviews, from those people in the interviews, and six months later, the press would be covering it. That's how far ahead the need was before the recognition of the need. Before the market even becomes public, it's in the minds of these other people who have a need and they're trying to solve it. That's why these interviews are so important. And I also recommend that people do this once or twice a year, especially if they're in fast moving markets, just to catch those little things that might be somebody standing out the door, somebody outside the door with money in their hands. Yeah, the change that's coming in the next six months that you need yep. to be aware of and on top of. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, you know, with chat GPT and artificial intelligence at the top of all of our, you know, news feeds and what yeah. have you. Yeah. Uh, tell me what you think of uh, AI copywriting for businesses today. I think that that's the weakest area of AI at the moment. AI, there are already a, a plethora of tools that are fascinating and wonderful that AI does well. And one of them is correlating data, trying to say, for example, which ad, which Google ad brought in the most conversions and you're going through billions of pieces of data. That's not something you want to set somebody to work on. AI can do it in 15 minutes, okay? Um, 
you have to be careful because it could if they're very the AI tone is very authoritative. Okay. Now, personally, I've been doing a little experiment. I've been sailing for 50 years. My husband and I had a catamaran built in South Africa and sailed at home together. And we've been sailing, you know, a long time. We should have started there because I'm an avid sailor myself. But I know. <laughs> I saw that. I was very impressed. Um, so one of the questions when, when, a, when the chat GPT first came out, I said, how do you sail upwind? Just tell me how to sail upwind. I read it and I thought if I took those instructions to the letter, I would end up on the rocks. Guaranteed. Okay. I tried again a few months ago, actually. And I tried again just recently. They were a little bit better, a little more detailed, but there were parts in there that were absolutely incorrect. Like mm. if you've sailed a boat with a tiller, you know that when you want to go that way, you push the tiller this way. Right. When you sail a boat with a, a wheel, you just turn like a car. This particular answer from chat GPT was that you always turn the boat tiller or wheel, you turn the boat away from the wind. <laughs> These are just little things, but yeah, the really. people who are subject matter experts are still the best at giving you insights that would keep you out of trouble. Okay. So I'm not convinced, and also the tone and the empathy and the character, the soul of the writer and writing, it, assuming the writer has interviewed customers and they know what they're talking about, all that, you just can't replicate that yet. They might get good at it. I haven't seen it yet. But as an analysis tool and a correlation tool, uh, a summarizing tool, man, AI is good. AI the, when AI first came out, I thought, man, Google's in trouble. Because instead of a whole bunch of millions of, re of, of responses, of results, you get a summary. And you can even use it for shopping. What are the top five, whatever? You know, I'm thinking of getting a, a pickup truck for my a, a new small boat that I have. And I could talk to my brother, which I will, because he's a car guy. But also I can say, okay, this is my situation and here's what I, what I want and see what it says. And, and it's pretty good for that because it's just doing a book report of the web. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think AI is going to change the way we buy in a big way, but it hasn't taken away the idea that there are real buyers out there who have already bought your product, already know about your company, already happy to help. And already had very specific things they can tell you that you're not going to get from a, a scraping of generalizations. We'll be right back. We're going to hear from another sponsor, Automation Booster, and we'll be right back. Don't go away. Is your business on autopilot yet? Do you have automation in place to capture, nurture, and convert prospects into clients via email, SMS, ringless voicemails, appointment setting? Get all the inbound and outbound marketing tools in one place. Go to marketingboostsolutions.com for more on automating your business so you can make money while you sleep. Welcome back. We're talking to Kristen Shivago on how to generate sales the right way, how to do that with delivering what your customer wants and how they want to buy your product. And only the first step is this the asking your clients, interviewing your clients and getting the right questions asked. I've got to read your book. I have not yet. I'm going to share my screen share shortly again so people can figure out where to find you and find your book. Uh, tell us more about the services you offer, because I, I recall your website also has a number of other free resources on there that you offer as well. Is that correct? Yes, I have some guides. I'm actually going to update the Mindset Driven Marketing Guide because I've learned a lot more since I wrote it and I want to update it. Um, and we're actually redoing our site uh, now, which is something one has to do. If you click on the logo up there, um, it shows the homepage and the services that we offer. Um, we are a full service digital agency. So anything at all, and we can do non-digital stuff too, obviously if the client needs it, but we basically provide all of the services, content marketing, email marketing, social, um, video, um, 
this, you can see auto marketing automation, um, pretty much anything anyone would need to get their product and service out there on, on the internet. We do e-commerce, of course. And for all of these, we have cust we have clients, I'm sorry, we have workers who are specialists in their area. I'm a cloud-based company. Everything is virtual. And what I have done is found people who specialize in these areas. They're really good at what they do. And then at the same time, we are a cohesive team because sometimes you hire specialists. They don't necessarily agree with each other. Um, so, and then if you go to an agency, usually they have people who are sort of brought on board, but they're not necessarily experts at that particular topic. So this is what we're doing. And, um, mostly we go after mid-sized companies, but we will work with some smaller ones as well. Um, I've sort of gotten tired of startups because they have cash flow problems to begin with, and they're still struggling to organize the company. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of that in Silicon Valley, but, um, so we just, we really focus on established companies who are frustrated with the digital marketing that they've been doing and discouraged that it hasn't worked out for them. So these, uh, all of these, and you do have some uh, white, uh, oh yeah, you got some eBooks and what have you, yeah. everything from. And there's a lot of podcasts that I've done um, and I write a subjects. blog, yeah. And I have a blog in there. Um, I just did one on the terrible toxic traits or the, the 10 toxic traits of terrible managers uh, in my blog. Very cool. So, so folks, if you're looking at this, ShivagoPartners.com, ShivagoPartners.com. Uh, and then one of my favorite sections here is the resources tab, you know, how to sell more in a recession. Why is it my marketing working? make sales with social media. So she's got, you know, quick and easy downloadable material to get you uh, thinking in the right direction, as well as, of course, the book we've been talking about all day. And one more time, the book is called, let's see if I can pull that back up here, um, Roadmap to Revenue. And um, you can find that on Amazon, Roadmap to Revenue by Kristen Shivago and get that book ordered today. I will be ordering that. I want to get that uh, survey, that survey, I guess, don't use the S word. <laughs> yeah, don't, I won't use, use the S word, but I need to sell my customers based on what they want. And that means I'm going to have to do some phone calls and interview some people and uh, follow your advice on exactly how to do that. And I recommend everybody listening do the same because it uh, seems like a, a very affordable uh, step to take, buy the book and learn how to do it. But then an affordable step on knowing what your customers want in the first place so you can sell your customers what they want to buy. I mean, right off the bat there, is, it seems like a very affordable, simple step that any business can take, assuming you've already got some clients that you can go back to. <laughs> so if you're just getting started, well, get your first half a dozen clients, you know, uh, in You can in also books. interview, you can interview people who might buy from you, but they can't be friends. That's right. a big mistake that entrepreneurs make where they sell to their friends. And then when they hire salespeople, they're like, why are you having so much trouble? I didn't have any trouble. Well, that's because your friends already trust you. <laughs> right. So you can't, it doesn't work. So anyway, yeah. yes. Well, great. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to, um, you know, plug as far as your products or services, Christian, that you want us to know about. I am writing another book. Um, it's called Love, Leverage, and Logistics, How You and Your Business Can Change the World. And it's about taking care of your people, your employer, your employees, your, your partners, and your customers. That's the love part. Leverage in the sense that if you do that, you get momentum that you would never get otherwise, positive revenue growing momentum. And logistics is about everything else. I mean, as I've done these marketing and sales turnarounds and helped companies grow, um, I've helped them with their systems, again, because of the tech background I've had, um, to make sure that they can keep their promises. Very cool. I look forward to that book as well. So guys, again, if you like the content we brought to today, I've totally enjoyed my interview with you, Kristen. Thank you so very much for being on our show. Same here. Thanks. And if you like the content we brought you folks, please give us a like and a 
But more importantly, comment below. Ask some questions here, and we'll get back to you about that. All of the links to uh, ShivagoPartners.com are in the show notes below, uh, as well as a link to her book, a link to her Facebook uh, page here where you can follow um, Kristen here, uh, and her Twitter page. So again, these links will all be in the show notes below, including her a LinkedIn page that you can log into and follow Kristen on LinkedIn. So again, thank you so much for being on the show and uh, folks subscribe, listen, share this episode with somebody else, please. We'd really appreciate if you did that. And of course, subscribe to the channel. Uh, before we wrap it up, Kristen, what is your next sailing adventure? What are you guys, you and your husband off to next? Or do you do uh, mostly coastal sailing nearby or do you all make long journeys? What is your we used to go to the Caribbean in the winters. Uh, we did that on our catamaran. Um, unfortunately, my husband got his second fatal cancer. The first one was before we bought that boat, and he survived that. Um, the second one was lung cancer, and I lost him in 2021. So I have a sailboat, and uh, I've just bought a, a kind of a, it's a tugboat kind of small cruising boat. And it's going to be me and my cats and my friends and family um, just to get out in the water and go a few more other places that I can't go in the sailboat. But oh. yes, yeah, still sailing will be until the end. <laughs> so sorry to hear about your husband. Um, yeah, we were I, best I, friends. I, no, yeah. I lost my late wife seven years ago as well. So I can relate with that. Yeah. Um, my catamaran was a little 35 foot uh, Gemini. Tell me. What oh, was yeah. The, yeah. What, what what did you have making that trip down to the Caribbean and back? Uh, bigger, and from I'm South sure. Africa, yeah. Um, it was an Atlantic 48, Ooh, which is a, nice. a high performance cruising catamaran. Cool. Currently, I'm spending most of my time on my um, 50 foot um, Ocean Alexander, a trawler. So we're kind of I don't have the uh, I don't have the the first mate with all the to help me as much as I used to with the sailing. So the, yeah. the trawler is a little bit easier to handle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understood. You bet. Well, Kristen, thanks so much again for being on the show, folks. One more time, like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Marketing Boost Solutions Podcast. Thanks for listening to another episode of Marketing Boost Solutions Podcast with your hosts, Captain Marco Torres. Now it's on you. Take the next step now. Go to marketingboostsolutions.com for more on how you can wow, delight, and surprise your clients with the most amazing draw card on the planet. So stay thirsty, my friends. Stay thirsty for knowledge. See you next time.